She is an organizer and the co-founder of the Black Voters Matter Fund. Welcome back to Pod Save America, Latasha Brown. Hi, thank you for having me. It's a good day to be alive in America. <laughs> <laughs> it is a good day, as was yesterday, as was Saturday. Absolutely. Each day seems to get a little bit brighter. So Saturday night, we watch President-elect Joe Biden, Vice President-elect Kamala Harris speak to the nation. Before we get to analysis, before we get to anything else, how did it feel? You know, it felt um, it's, it, it felt great. It's interesting. I was so happy. I, I thought I went through every emotion. Now, listen, I went through every emotion you could have this week because when you were saying going through the days, I was like Friday. I was like, I don't know. Friday and Thursday were a little shaky. Um, <laughs> Wednesday, I had a complete meltdown. Tuesday, I felt really confident. I was like, we got this. And then, and I knew that the vo that the votes would come in. But I think what really shocked me, and it's funny because on Wednesday, I knew that Biden and the Harris Biden and Harris ticket was going to win. But the fact that 75 million people voted for this bully, this man who has just been so unkind um, to people in this country and racism, misogynist, and um, uh, you know, just a liar. Like the fact that 75 million people um, would vote, would support him really like, I actually had a meltdown. I actually cried on Wednesday. I was like, what are we doing where people don't love each other? Like, because for me, he has been so rooted in hate and division and fear. You know, it just, you know, it was a, it was a, a somber moment for me, but I will say, and then each day went by, I was like, all right, I know the number's coming, but y'all need to come on now, hurry up, <laughs> you know? And then so Saturday, what I felt is I felt resolved. I felt like all of this work that we've done and so many other groups um, has been doing, have been doing for um, the last four years and some of us even more than a decade that this moment, um, this, this moment was all resulting from the coalition of people who love democracy coming together and saying, we're going to defeat hate. We're going to defeat bigotry. We're going to defeat Trump. I was like, bye bye, <laughs> boy, bye. Bye. <laughs> so nowhere was that fight um, more important uh, than in Georgia, where we saw uh, the culmination of organizing that had been going on for years. Organization uh, you helped lead, organization Stacey Abrams uh, helped lead. You know, you were so bullish about Georgia. You were saying, keep an eye on Georgia, watch Georgia. Can you just talk about the moment when uh, it finally happened and we saw uh, the numbers change and the votes had been counted and Joe Biden had and Kamala Harris had taken the lead in Georgia. And we knew that John Ossoff and Reverend Warnock were going to a runoff. Well, what I'm going to say first, John, is I'm never going to tell you I told you so. Did I say I told you so? I'm not <laughs> going to say, but you just, didn't in say case, I didn't, just in case, <laughs> I just know because I would never tell you I told you so, but just in case. You um, didn't say it. You won't say it. <laughs> Why would you say it? I did say it because I saw it. I kept telling people, I kept saying, yes, the South is red until it ain't, right? And so um, that has been my mantra for actually years because I know the organizing power in the South. What we've seen is, you know, the South isn't red or blue. The South has been underinvested. And so when you look at who makes up the South and when you look at the diversity of the South, you would know that the potential has always been there. It wasn't by accident of what we saw on that um, on that calendar, but I can tell you what I felt. What happened is I was watching Kornacki in his, you know, right mm -hmm. on the, the screen as the rest of us were doing, right? Being fascinated with, I was like, oh, I want those, one of those screens at home. Um, that what was interesting is when they were talking about Georgia, um, Fulton County, there were uh, several counties that were still out. It was Chat Chatham, um, it was Fulton County and Clayton County, and I was like, oh, game over. Like at that point, I was like, game over, because I knew the work that had been done with Fulton County. I knew the the voters who were in, in uh, Fulton County and what the projected numbers were. And so when I saw that, like before, it's like, you know, when I saw that, I knew. When I saw the numbers coming in, I wish I could say I was surprised, but I wasn't. Like, because I- Because you told I, us so. I told you all that, so, you know, I, I wasn't surprised. I felt um, like I, I felt affirmed and resolved. I felt like 
I want to tell everybody. I just want to go on Twitter and say, I told y'all. Didn't I tell y'all? You know, and so that's what I felt. I felt like the power that I knew, the power that is here, um, that we had, that certainly there was something that has been changing in, in Georgia. And the piece that I also want to kind of lift up is poetic justice, that in the state that was ground zero for voter suppression, and I've worked all over this nation and particularly, I'm from Alabama, right? So I can tell you a little bit about voter suppression. Mm -hmm. um, and so for, for the kind of voter suppression that I witnessed and I saw in the state of Georgia, right, just two years ago, and I knew for, for, for this to be the state that was really the turning point even in the election predictions, to be the state that black voters would come out in mass and actually are on the brink of delivering, right, a balance at, at least two seats to um, the Democratic Party. There was something very poetic about that. I'm, I'm, I'm one of those people, I'm one of those folks that I believe in signs, yes, I'm her, I'm that person. And I was like, this is a sign, y'all. I told y'all, I was at a, we were campaigning on, uh, Monday, no, Tuesday. On Tuesday, we were campaigning, uh, and I, it, we were on the street corner yelling. We we're trying to get it in, and we were standing on Victory Boulevard. And then I look over, and it's like this Walmart shop, shopping park cart, I mean, uh, plaza, and it's Victory Square. And I drive people crazy around signs. I was like, I told y'all, I was like, we're going to win. And they were like, well, how you know we're going to win? I was like, we're on Victory Boulevard. I told you we're going to win. <laughs> <laughs> so it was right. So I was right. The sign was right. So, uh, you know, you mentioned this, that one of the, I think early on, especially, um, you know, as we were watching the vote numbers come in, we saw that Trump had turned out, Republicans had turned out an extraordinary turnout, second only to the turnout of Democrats across the country, the most extraordinary turnout uh, in, in uh, modern history. You know, uh, you helped do that organizing it is very clear that we're in a tough fight here, right? We have to keep up this momentum. We have to keep making sure that people feel invested in the process. We have these two runoffs coming up. One thing you said uh, that you you had mentioned this to, uh, on NBC, that one thing you learned through the Obama years was that we have to keep demanding policies of significance to black communities uh, after this election is done. How do we keep this momentum going? How do we make sure that people feel invested uh, in winning these uh, Senate runoffs and then invested in the success of this presidency of those that we helped elect, elect so that we keep this turnout going because it's so clear that we're going to need it? You know, I think there's a couple of things. I think part of it is in the messaging that even for us, we had a message that said this was bigger than Biden. That while certainly we wanted to see the the Biden, um, uh, president elect Biden in office and and Vice President um, Kamala Harris, that sounds so good. I love saying that um, <laughs> in office. That what was important for us to know is that this was a real opportunity for us to beat back fascism, that we had to recommit ourselves to building a reflective democracy. And in order to do that, we can't just be transactional. And so if we think that we're just gonna vote this election and everything is gonna be fine, you know, we are delusional. The truth of the matter is that as long as there are 38 million people in this country that are in poverty and the wealthiest country in the world, that fundamentally we have to have major structural changes for America to be the nation that we believe that we deserve. And in order to have that, you have to have a healthy democracy. And in order to have a healthy democracy, you have to have an engaged electorate. And so what I think that we have to think about is that while this election was key, I hope that we don't see this as a just a, as a transaction moment, that we reduce yeah, yeah. it. This was just about getting Trump out of office. No, what this is really about is we have to shape the future going forward, not just because Trump was in office. What Trump did, the gift that Trump did bring us, because he did bring or something. What Trump brought us is Trump made it real for us to understand the fragility of this democracy, right? Trump made it real for us to recognize. We start seeing, you know, it's kind of like um, it, even in my home, in my home uh, during quarantine, I started looking at my walls and started noticing imperfections in the wall that I never saw before. I thought my wall was fine in my office. <laughs> I was like, my wall is fine. And I started seeing these little imperfections in the wall because I was forced to sit in here during quarantine and pay attention. Trump forced us to pay attention to what is really happening in America. We can no longer just go about our day-to-day -day lives and we're gonna go to our jobs and go to school and everything is fine. And we not worry about politics, they'll take care of that, right? 
we have to recognize that he has forced us to sit in this room to look at these walls, to look at the shape of democracy, to look at the vulnerability that in this moment of COVID-19, if there's ever a time that we should be having a discussion around comprehensive health care and health care access, it would be now. If there's any a time that we're supposed to be really thinking about this economy, like think about this, John. This is the wealthiest nation on the earth, on the planet, right? And here it is, she could not even sustain her people for two months without screaming and yelling, I'm not gonna make it, something is wrong. If you are a wealthy person and you fall on bad times for two months and you get something, your finances ain't developed, something is not right. My point is there are some economic, structural economic issues that we've got to deal with this in this in this country as well. And then I think when we're talking about racism, you know, it's just not enough for us. And I do think that there was this 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 sense of American exceptionalism that has had everybody lulled to sleep for years. That you know there was this belief, just like we kind of look at the market. Oh, if you have a free market economy, it'll correct itself, right? We looked at this thing around democracy. Oh yeah, okay, their Republicans are doing voter suppression to black people, right? But don't worry about it. Democracy will correct itself until millions of white people in this country got a taste of what it feels to feel disenfranchised. Until Absolutely. white people in this country realize that the very thing, because I remember one of my friends, very good friend of mine um, in California, who I love to death was saying, Early on in the Trump, when, when Trump first went into office, there were some things that I said he was going to do. And she was like, he can't do that. He won't, he, he's not allowed to do that. And he did it. And I said, you know what? The reason why I know that is because I'm from the Deep South and we live with Trump every day. Like that Trump is not a new phenomenon to us. There are many Trumps, i.e. Lindsey Graham, i.e. <laughs> I can go down the list. The bottom line is that all of us, can be disenfranchised just by having a bad leader that puts himself in a position of and abuses his power in a way that he undermines democracy. None of, none of us are immune from that when we let the very fabric of protecting democracy be unraveled. And so when we don't fight for the voting rights of, of African Americans or Native Americans or any American in this country, we leave ourselves, all of us vulnerable to not just voter suppression, but vulnerable to the dismantling of democracy. So I'm hoping that we recognize in this moment how critical it is for us to shift how we show up. Because on some level, we have been complicit in where we found ourselves these last four years. So. We have beaten back this one threat, this threat of Trump, right? We will remove him. And now everybody is paying attention. You're right. There are millions of white people who got a taste of disenfranchisement and they hated it and they're paying attention. And this big, beautiful coalition is paying attention. Where do you want that attention to go next? After you take a break and, <laughs> and get a chance to, 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 to catch, we all get a chance to catch our breath. What is to you the next place you want to direct this, this big coalition towards um, towards the work that we still have to do? You know, I got a mil million policy ideas I can put on the table, but I'll just tell you what's coming up in my spirit right now to say that at the end of the day, what I want people to do, if they could just take this one phrase and let this start driving our politics, for the love of humanity, what would policy look like if we start operating and saying, I'm going to support this policy for the love of humanity. And what I mean by that is even when I vote, I don't vote based on what I think about my tax bracket. Like, not like I'm at some high tax bracket or anything, I'm implying. But the fact of the matter is when I vote, I am always voting for the most vulnerable in my community because I know that if there's a safety net for the most vulnerable of us, then the rest of us will also benefit from that. And so I am hoping that in this moment that what this coalition will see themselves as is beyond the confinements of a party um, affiliation, beyond the confinements of what we see ourselves as race and gender, that beyond that, that at the end of the day, at the core of our humanity, that as we go forward talking about governance, that we govern in a way 
for the love of humanity that we create and demand policies that all people, what's so wrong with everybody having health care? I'm so confused around that. I don't even understand why that's a debate. Why would we not want everybody to have health care? At the end of the day, worst case scenario, people can get, sick people can get well. I mean, like, at the end of the day, it's ludicrous for me because I think part of what has happened is that we have we have been taught that it is okay to be selfish in our politics, right? Not just in terms of just the political parties, but it's been selfish in our politics. And in some ways we have been a tool and a proxy of actually providing more power, um, getting caught up in the party the parties, right? Than we have around people. And so everything gets defined within the context of a party paradigm, right? It's either the, you're on the blue team or you're on the red team. No, I'm on the humanity team. That's what team I'm on. And so, I really want people to shift their paradigm of why we're doing this, that we're getting so caught up in fights um, and so caught up in the, even the very notion that my rights as a voter is safer, whether it's one party or another party in office. Now, I know that that's true because of what the political landscape in right now, because the Republicans right now are just crazy. There's nothing else I can say, right, but to, to allow a man who has just been vicious, right, um, allow a man who has left our country vulnerable in the midst of the largest health pandemic, they are complicit. And I'm not going to, and I'm not saying that because they're Republican, I'm saying it because that is inhumane. And if the Democrats did that, and to the extent they do that, I will call that out too. And so we're going to have to have some courage to move back to really be able to force the parties to be responsible and re accountable to us instead of the opposite. We can no longer just continue to get caught up in this football game of which team you are on the red or the blue team. We got to be on the humanity team and we got to be on the rainbow team. And so I think that is really important for us in this moment. You know, I, I, I want to just share this little story that I always talk about around diamond and glass. That if you know how a diamond is created, that all a diamond is is a piece of coal that under extreme pressure over time becomes a diamond. That glass, all glass is, is sand that's been compacted, right, and uh, with heat, and over, it becomes glass. And we know both of those things, what make both of those elements significant to us is that their properties is because they become clear. They have clarity that in fact, the pressure created a circumstances and change transformed them that they became clear substances. I think that we've got to do that. In this moment, we got to take all of this pain and this trauma that Trump has created in this moment and that pressure, I'm hoping that pressure doesn't say, well, we got Trump out of office, let's go back home. But that that, that pressure transforms us, that we have more clarity about what we need to bring a nation together, that what really healing is going to mean. Like, like we're ready for healing tomorrow. No, we're not. We're not ready for healing because we haven't been honest about where the pain. We got to stop the pain. If you want to start healing, stop the pain. If 38 million Americans are in poverty, stop the pain. When you've got a prison industrial complex that we are seeing millions of folks more than any place in the world that are locking folks up and throwing away the key and acting like they're not human beings, stop the pain. If we want to see folks, hundreds of thousands of people that are dying for COVID-19, stop the pain. When you got 68% of black women who are voting, who are working low wage jobs that don't have any economic security, but continuously show up for this nation to save America for herself, stop the pain. And so I want us to also feel a certain level of discomfort and pressure in this moment that we take this opportunity to really be able to shape policies boldly and force the political parties, right, to literally not go back to their comfort position. Because this ain't about the Democratic Party getting power for me. Now, for some folks, it may be, right? It, for me, it is about people having a say and that people being taken care of and that I, the, the agenda that works, the agenda that has worked the best and been the most responsive for, for us has been the agenda by, by the Democratic Party, but it doesn't go far enough and they've not done enough. And so we have to pressure ourselves because I'm not asking folks to call, to put pressure on anybody else. I'm saying me, I've not done enough. And I work, I work 16, 18 hours a week, right? And so even as much as I've done, I've been very reflective of how I've been complicit in what America has become, right? And so even my own behavior, I'm looking at 
how, as a consumer, how, have I treated the earth well when I'm looking at climate change? How, have I been a good steward of the earth? Have I been a good neighbor? Have I been a good friend? Have I just been a good human being? And so I think I so want us to make this moment be beyond politics, that I want us to make this moment be centered in, and I know it, as corny as it may sound to some, but literally within the quotations for the love of humanity. Latasha Brown, thank you so much. I'm, you know. Thank you, thank you for having me. Yeah, and make sure you celebrate. We still got yeah. still a couple of hours to celebrate before we hit the ground. <laughs> <laughs> And do this all over again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we got to take a break and then get back to it, right? We get a break. You got to celebrate the wins. It yeah, makes it sustainable. I do want to tell people that, like, we jump right in, like, what we got to do next? Take the time just to say, America, thank you. Those yeah. that stood and had courage, thank you. This While Black people, literally, and I think Black women were on the forefront, Black women and Black men were on the forefront and led this charge, this was a collective victory. This is what happens when we work together. And just like we were able to defeat this regime or whatever he is, whatever he call himself, <laughs> right? That fundamentally we can literally radically reimagine this nation and create it to be what it, we want it to be. Not what the political parties feed us, but what we want it to be. So I'm just asking us to lean into this moment, to celebrate and to really reorient ourselves and recommit ourselves to literally creating the America that we all deserve. Natasha Brown couldn't say it better. Thank you so all much right. for being here. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Yeah, right. yeah.